thank you <laughs> for inviting me here. Thank you for coming. Uh, I especially appreciate the invitation from Dr. Diaz and the uh, opportunity to be a part of this conference this year. I appreciate the support that the conference has received from the university and the university hospital. And I'm really happy to be able to speak about Frankenstein. When uh, Dr. Diaz told me of the theme and the focus this year, I tried very hard to think of a literary work, literary works that would be relevant and helpful in the discussions. And finally, I realized that Frankenstein is uh, probably my best choice. This work is um, certainly become a classic in the field of medical humanities and bioethics and is celebrating quite a remarkable 200th anniversary this year of its first publication in 1818. The worldwide um, conferences and celebrations started actually in Geneva in 2016 because um, that was the year in which Mary Shelley wrote the work, although it was not published until 2018. And Geneva is so very close to the location uh, where Mary Shelley and her group of intellectuals were when she wrote it that I think they wanted to be sure that they got the jump uh, on the rest of the world. But conferences have taken place in so many locations this year, it's hard to recap them all. Um, beginning in the United States at the University of Wisconsin early last fall and culminating, I would say, in the United States perhaps in the conference at Stanford University this spring. And there is about to be a conference in Australia which they are calling the Monster Conference, uh, leading um, to several interpretations and approaches. So it is a major work and I think it is what in literature we would call an urtext that is an older text that has created um, the opportunity for many texts that were to come and that will continue to come to take up more specific issues as our biotechnology changes. I think it's very um, important to be clear at the beginning that I am talking about Mary Shelley's novel. I am not talking about the movies that are the 20th century spinoff from that novel. And uh, those of you who have read the novel know that there's a vast difference. Those of you who haven't read the novel but have seen the movies, please let me say first and foremost that Frankenstein is not the name of the monster in the novel, but Frankenstein is the name of the creator of the, I'll call him the creature rather than refer to him as the monster. So things got flipped. I think it's fascinating to think about how they changed so much in popular culture and what re they were responding to in the general sort of public uh, mind or fears of such things as creating artificial life forms at that time. So I want to start with a look at the context in which the work was created because the story of the creation and writing of Frankenstein is almost as fascinating as the work itself. And then I will look at um, here the edges of life as they uh, appear in the lives of Mary Shelley and her coterie, and also in the novel, and then at the ethical issues that are raised by those. And I will conclude with a brief look at some of the enduring influences, um, at least in many uh, areas, of this work on the way in which we think about these ethical issues. So who? Who was the creator of this work, the author? It's not uh, as simple a question as it sounds, although I am going to uh, officially uh, declare that I am one of the ones who believes that Mary Shelley did in fact write this work. Um, others argue that. There's a new book out in the United States saying that a young woman of her age and lack of past literary accomplishment could not possibly have written such a work and it must have been written by Percy Shelley, um, her lover and then her husband and one of the 
uh, well-known British romantic poets of the time. Um, there are many reasons to dispute this. I won't belabor you with all of them, but to say that I think this very young woman uh, who was still a teenager when she began the writing of this work is the one who is the primary author. I tried to find a good uh, portrait of her from that time in her life and was able, unable to do so, but this death mask of Mary Shelley clearly has been the source of a portrait that captures her in her early youth and features that. One of the things I think is very interesting about this is that the people who were involved in this were all so very young when they were um, reading and writing and talking together. This is a picture of Mary Shelley later in her life, the portrait that you're likely to find if you Google, Google her looking for a portrait. And it was accompanied um, when it was first shown by lines from her husband's poem, The Revolt of Islam, in which he called her a child of love and light. And certainly a child of love, there's I think was a true love story, no question about that, a child of light. I think because she, like him, was very much interested in new intellectual uh, frontiers and wanted to bring light to the world. They were both um, revolutionaries in their own way. And his poem, The Revolt of Islam, is really uh, a poem written trying to encourage democratic revolt in some of the Islamic countries of the time. Uh, it was so revolutionary uh, in some of its declarations that his friends tried to talk him out of publishing it and were able to talk him into revising it, which he did sufficiently uh, well that it's a very difficult poem to read. Um, and perhaps he was saved the imprisonment that they expected he would uh, incur because of those revisions. This is a portrait of William Godwin, who uh, was Mary Shelley's father. He was a philosopher, a social thinker, a revolutionary, um, and he created an intellectual milieu and an education for Mary Shelley that was unlike that that she probably would have found uh, anywhere else. Um, he was focused on social justice, on freeing the oppressed, on many of the ideas that we still struggle with today. And this is the portrait of Mary Wollstonecraft, uh, Mary Shelley's mother, who died 10 days after Mary Shelley's birth as a result of childbed fever, and who had been a very outspoken, um, what should I say, claimant for the rights of women so that Mary Shelley grew up reading her mother's works and uh, thinking of her own trajectory as something other than the traditional one that would have been uh, expected of her, perhaps, in other circumstances. Percy Bysshe Shelley, the man that she was in love with and living with and with whom she had a child when she was 16, uh, that child died three days after birth. And Percy Shelley was, um, as I said previously, very well known as a British romantic poet at that time, a free thinker, believed in free love and many other ideas that were not uh, acceptable at the time. Um, he and Mary Shelley did marry after the birth of their second child and at the end of 1816, the year in which she wrote Frankenstein. This George Gordon, Lord Byron, their close friend, another revolutionary British romantic poet uh, who was also uh, roaming the continent having left England and with whom they continued their conversations and their friendships um, when they were, as he was, staying outside Geneva. Claire Claremont, a half-sister of Mary Shelley, had fled the continent with them and was following Byron around. She was desperately in love with Byron, who was not so much in love with her, but in, they did certainly have an affair, and she bore him a child that, again, did not survive very long. 
This is William Polidori, who was Byron's physician, living with him and traveling with him on the continent and with this group uh, the evening when all the discussions that sparked Frankenstein occurred. This is the villa that um, Lord Byron had rented on the shores of Lake Geneva, the Villa Diodati, uh, and where in fact the group came in the evenings often for their intellectual discussions and where the initial um, discussions of the works that ended up for Mary Shelley and Frankenstein occurred. I want to, if you've seen, been to um, Lake Geneva, you know that it is a very beautiful lake in between, uh, on the one side, the Alps, and the other side, the Jura Mountains. It can be serene like this, but it's a very um, volatile climate. Um, it's sometimes kind of like Texas. In the one minute, it looks serene and beautiful, and the next minute, you have a storm raging over the lake. And I chose this picture because it does show such a storm, but also shows one with the electrical uh, strikes that were coming because electricity features very prominently in this work. The mountains, the ice, the snow, the cold also uh, feature prominently in the setting of Frankenstein. And the group um, actually took a trip up to what's called La Mer de Glace, the Sea of, of Glass, which is up very high near Mont Blanc, which you can see here, and very near uh, the now skiing village of Chamonix. Um, the mountains and the wildness of nature were very important to the romantics and play important roles in the setting of the work. And I think part of what they also do is to bring into the work the conception of what the romantic poets call the sublime, a kind of beauty that wasn't calm and peaceful but was uh, very frightening and went to the core of people's spiritual or philosophic beliefs. Another scene of snow and ice on Lake Geneva, not uh, too far away, I think, in recent mis history. Uh, since Geneva has been hit by some very powerful snow and ice storms recently. So 1816 is when this uh, work was inculcated. Uh, it was referred to throughout Europe as the year without a summer. And the year without a summer was caused by the volcanic eruption of Mount Tambora uh, near Bali in Indonesia which had actually occurred in 1815. It had taken a very long time for the volcanic ash to travel in the stratosphere and begin to block the sun's um, rays onto the continent. It's still considered the largest volcanic eruption in human history. And the volcanic dust and ash and sulfur dioxide uh, caused significant climate change and lowered the temperature sufficiently in North America and Europe that there was widespread famine, starvation, and disease. What there was by the Via Villa Diodati was a very cold, wet, and rainy, dreary summer. That was very important because in that time, um, when the weather was not conducive for the group to go out and hike as they might usually have done. They had to find ways to amuse themselves in the evening and they did so for a period of time by reading German ghost stories. Um, and one night then as they were reading these ghost stories and talking with each other, they agreed that each of them would write a ghost story, taking the model the German ghost story, for um, competition among themselves. As it turned out, uh, the weather got better <laughs> in a day or so, and uh, Shelley and Byron went out hiking, and that left Mary Shelley and Polidori as the only two who actually wrote works out of the competition, and only Mary Shelley's Frankenstein, which was published anonymously, turned out to be 
and important work. There are a lot of scientific contexts that were playing uh, in the conversations of the group at that time, um, arguments about vitalist versus materialist explanations of life, um, saying that was analogous to soul plus electricity. Uh, they had read and were interested in Benjamin Franklin's The History and Present State of Electricity with original experiments, and galvanism was a topic that was very much um, influential, I think, in Mary Shelley's thinking uh, about what was going on with efforts to reanimate um, dead frogs or other dead creatures. So questions about reanimation of dead bodies was very much part of the general conversation that they had. And Mary Shelley was actually reading Humphrey, Humphrey Davies' Elements of Chemical Philosophy uh, while she was writing Frankenstein. And I think it's, it can't be overstated that Mary Shelley was not your ordinary teenage girl of the time. She was very well educated and highly interested in a variety of topics, including scientific ones. Um, and the group was also very much caught up in the political ideas that were um, close to them uh, geographically and in time uh, with the fall of the Bastille in 1789 and Mary Wollstonecraft's thoughts on the education of daughters and vindication of the rights of women um, and William Godwin, Mary Shelley's father, uh, an inquiry concerning political injustice and then the French Revolution that continued uh, to rage for a while. So there was a lot going on uh, in their conversations and influencing Mary Shelley as she took up that dare that was made that evening in talking about writing a ghost story or something they're like. The mythological, religious, and literary context are also important and from Greek mythology, the figure of Prometheus, because the subtitle of Frankenstein is or the modern Prometheus. Prometheus was a titan. The titans came before the established um, Greek gods, such as Zeus. And Prometheus is, it depends upon the myth you read. As you know, Greek myths vary in their tellings um, a lot. He either created humans from clay or he gave humans fire. And in punishment of that act, Zeus, who was in charge of the Greek pantheon at that time, uh, had chained him to a rock so that an eagle could eat his liver every day. Now you may think, I, I think, um, if he ate his liver every day, wouldn't his liver be gone shortly and the punishment over? But this is a little, um, again, mythological, re-established itself so that the punishment could continue uh, in perpetuity. Other um, literary works, mythological, religious, um, that are important in the background are especially John Milton, the English poet's epic Paradise Lost, uh, which Mary Shelley knew very well and uses allusions to throughout. And this uh, is basically the story of Paradise Lost by the rebellious angels who dared to um, challenge God and their after were forever cut off from God and from the light, if you will. And the epigraph on the title page of the original Frankenstein was taken from Paradise Lost and goes, did I request the maker from my clay to mold me man? Did I solicit thee from darkness to promote me? And this is a quote of, um, the work that I think speaks directly to the circumstance of the creature that Frankenstein has put together and animated. There are other contexts that I think speak to the ethical questions that emerge from this work, and one certainly is um, the medieval German legend of Faust, and as most of you will remember, I suspect, Faust was 
uh, in search of all knowledge to the extent that he wanted to understand how to create life and was willing to sell his soul to the devil in exchange for knowledge and power while he lived. That uh, version changed over time in different works. Um, manuscript from Wolfen Butler here, the Spies edition, and came into English literature through the work of Christopher Marlowe in his play, The Tragical History of Dr. Faustus from 1604, and remains one of the great works of German literature in the version by Goethe um, in the early 19th century. And Goethe, uh, like Mary Shelley, we might say, and uh, other contemporaries of the time, was not only a, a towering figure in literature, but also very fascinated by science and did a lot of research and reading of his own. The underlying, um, I think, issue for Faust in the tragical history of Dr. Faustus from Marlowe is precisely being able to create life. Faust has become so jaded with all that he knows. He studied everything that's possible, all of the traditional uh, professions that we know today, and decided there was nothing particularly important or noteworthy about any of those, um, but that if he could just create life, then he would have done something significant. Um, the edges of life, uh, creation of human beings by God, and I've added here, and by Prometheus, certainly are incredibly important in Frankenstein. Um, and as we verge on creating life forms ourselves, I think this is a heritage to acknowledge natural human childbirth by women and its dangers, I would say. It's dangerous very much on Mary Shelley's mind in knowing of the death of her mother a few days after her own birth. And Mary Shelley's first child, a young, a young girl, died three days after birth. And as Mary Shelley wrote about that in a letter to a friend of hers shortly afterwards, she wrote about getting up in the middle of the night to uh, feed the baby, only to be unable to rouse her, and yet somehow not realizing yet, it came a little later, that the child was, was dead. And this haunted Mary Shelley. She talks about having dreams about it and having seen images of it um, for, you know, the, the, not only the immediate time afterward that she was writing then, but later, that that stayed with her in a way that haunted her. So I think the fears of giving birth to um, a child that might die, to a deformed or monstrous child, were very much in Mary Shelley's mind. She had recently given birth to her second child, a son, William, who did survive for three years. So at the time of her writing, he was alive. But all of these things were part of the fears that she brought to the work. And then we come to the artificial creation of life by Frankenstein, a student of medicine and science, who arguably um, was increasingly, um, I would say, um, perhaps even at the point of mental illness and his obsession, like Faust, with doing something that would be unparalleled and would make him well-known and famous. And that something for him uh, began to focus on taking spare body parts and reanimating them into a living creature. Um, what followed, of course, was his revulsion and rejection of his creature, and I don't call the creature a monster despite the later things that happened in, in the book, because I think that it wasn't his original creation that made him monstrous, but uh, the way in which he was abandoned by his creator. The deaths I've talked about as well, um, a natural death in Mary Wollstonecraft's case, the um, desire to restore life, and the suicide of Mary Shelley's half-sister Fanny Imlay and Percy Shelley's wife Harriet 
uh, while uh, Mary Shelley and Shelley himself, Percy Shelley, were living together, uh, left their marks on Mary Shelley, certainly, and the murders that are ultimately created by, or enacted by Frankenstein's creature um, of Frankenstein's brother, friend, and wife are the things that hang in popular culture memory, I think, from the work um, and have made the transposition of the name that of the monster to be frightened by. This occurred after, Fra excuse me, Frankenstein had destroyed his efforts to create a mate for his creature. The creature said to him, okay, you have abandoned me, essentially. Uh, I am unlike any other creature. At least create for me another of my kind, and I promise, he says, to go away and live with her um, peacefully and never bother you again. So one of the temptations for Frankenstein certainly was, and he got started on it, whether or not to create that uh, wife for Frankenstein. And he's pretty far along in his work when the creature comes to see how it's going. And Frankenstein at that point decides there's no way he can justify this ethically because whatever he does may result in a new race of beings that will not go away peacefully but will inevitably come back and harm humans. So he destroys what he's made. And at that point, the monster, uh, as he calls him, uh, becomes furious, bides his time, and retaliates by destroying all of those whom Frankenstein, his creator, loved so much. The ethical issues that I think are embedded in this story um, are ones that go back long before its origin, but that still speak to uh, us today, I think, in very powerful ways, today in very specific ways that many of you have discussed. But the question of forbidden knowledge, are there limits that we should not uh, breach in our, and I use our even though I'm not a scientist, but in our research uh, and biomedical efforts to find ways to enhance the lives of human beings? The relationship between creativity and responsibility, I think, is the most powerful theme for me in seeing this work um, brought to the stage um, in a play adaptation that was performed at London's National Theatre and is on video. If you have ever a chance to see it, I recommend it to you because it's, first I thought you can't make a play about this novel, it's just not gonna work. And when I saw it, I was stunned by how well it worked and how closely it used the language of the work so that even though I had read the novel several times, when I heard the words spoken in the play, it was as if I was hearing some of them really for the first time in, in a context that, that truly mattered. And the relationship that's not assumed by Frankenstein when his creature is animated and begins to get up and walk about, he's horrified. He's horrified, um, I think, not so much as it's presented by what he's done, creating this artificial life form, if you will, but by its ugliness, its monstrosity, as he describes it, the physical, uh, the largeness of stature of the creature, the color of the creature that he sort of jerry-rigged together, and he, Frankenstein, runs away. The creature is left on its own to try to fend for itself, find food for itself, shelter for itself, until he ends up um, by um, a, in a village watching uh, a family live there, and he learns to speak their language 
by listening to them read books to each other in the evening, and he begins to do good things for them, kind things for them, because he's big and strong. He can chop firewood for them. They're working very hard to eke out a subsistence living. And he takes care of them, but does not show himself to them, because he's already discovered that when people see him, they are frightened and they will become violent. His experience with human beings to that point has been all bad. But he has great hopes uh, because of the loving kindness of this family uh, among its members. And the father is blind. So he waits until the others are away one day and goes in to talk to the father, who is very kind to him, can't see him. And they begin uh, a relationship that has, I think, great hope for providing the kind of nurturance that the creature is seeking. But when the children come home and see the monster, all is over. I mean, they are frightened, they throw him out, they leave, they never come back. So what the creature is learning is that people are scary, human beings are scary. If you don't look like them, um, they are likely to assume the worst of you and to treat you in very violent ways. Um, and he goes from that realization in his wanderings to following the creature and doesn't really become what some would say evil. I would question that until after, as I have said, Frankenstein damages, destroys the mate that the creature has asked for. I think there are also important questions uh, in this text, underlying this text, about gender differences and creativity and responsibility. And I think those come certainly from Mary Shelley's experience uh, of pregnancy and birth at the time. And the question would be, you know, if women are able to bring life into the world, but men cannot, is this part of why they are seeking uh, to discover new frontiers in science, medicine, and in the frame tale of uh, Frankenstein, the story of Robert Walton, discovery, discovery in his case of uh, the Arctic, the polar, the polar caps. Um, so I'll leave that for now, but just say that uh, there are two films that are being made and released this year about Mary Shelley. One of them is titled Mary Shelley. I've seen the trailer for it. I haven't seen the entire film. But in that trailer, this very, very young, very beautiful woman is charging uh, in to argue with a publisher who's insisting that she could not have written the manuscript that she has brought to him and that it must have been written by her husband. And so she's very, very powerful in articulating uh, what we would say her mother's legacy of the rights of women to create not only um, children, but books and to make inroads in other ways. Uh, the other film is Iranian, and I don't know much about it, but I certainly hope that it becomes available to see very soon. Another thing incredibly important, I think, in this is the importance of friendship, mentors, and colleagues because Frankenstein is really in a very disordered mental state when he becomes obsessed with creating um, a creature that, to whom he can give life. And he has secluded himself from friends, mentors, colleagues, and family at that time. And there have been a number of uh, articles written about research ethics saying that you know the uh, important thing about this work in relation to research ethics is indeed you know, not working in isolation, staying in communication with your colleagues, uh, your mentors, your friends, and review of your work. Had Frankenstein not been so secluded and isolated, then in all probability, uh, we would never have had this tale. And um, whether we would be better off or not, I would, you know, it's an interesting thing to discuss. Um, and I would raise the question of physical versus moral monstrosity as being one of the key ethical issues that emerges uh, because the creature is not monstrous in a moral sense at all. In fact, it's possible to make, I think, a strong argument that the creature is more moral 
than the creator, Frankenstein, and yet it's his physical, words are hideous, um, monstrosity that makes him so reviled and so thrown out of the society in which he is set to live. The enduring influence of Frankenstein um, is one of the amazing things about it, and it's had this powerful afterlife in popular culture. The question I think that needs to be uh, discussed about that is why this distorted version of Frankenstein has emerged and remained so remarkably popular with a whole list of American movies, among others, um, still being viewed, and still being viewed sometimes in conjunction with the celebrations about the novel itself. I think it has uh, enduring influence in bioethics and medical humanities. Uh, it's been called by many, not just J. Paul Hunter, although he certainly won, um, an almost canonical text, uh, a paradigm-breaking and exemplary text. J. Paul Hunter is an 18th century a uh, literature scholar who was selected to be the editor, the general editor for the Norton Critical Edition, of, second edition of Shelley's Frankenstein. So he knows the work extremely well. He knows the works about the work extremely well and is in a good position to, I think, make this claim. But I've heard for years, probably 20 years at least, People in bioethics and medical humanities say, you know, there's only one real text. You know, Frankenstein has got it all. And now there have been, in this year, uh, an incredible number of works published about Frankenstein. And I think after this year, probably scholarship will diminish a bit. Finally, in science, and now this is a very American um, experience, the question is, you know, the enduring influence of this work in science. So the National Science Foundation uh, in the United States has awarded a $3 million grant to what's called the Frankenstein Project at Arizona State University. I'm thinking, why would they do that in a time when grant monies are exceedingly difficult to come by for biomedical research, yet they have given a huge grant to this project? And I think that would not have occurred had they not thought that this was worthy of that attention and regard. Um, the MIT, Massachusetts Institute of Technology Press, has published a recent edition of Frankenstein, which I hold up here, that was put out as part of this Frankenstein project. And this is annotated for scientists, engineers, and creators of all kinds. So it leaves it open. Um, this work uh, came, the annotations came from calls that they put out to more than a thousand respondents who were willing to help them go through and look at all the terms and all of the um, ideas in the work that the respondents thought students in those fields would not be likely to know, especially not in the 21st century when this was written. Uh, in 1816, um, and they have created as well um, a website to which I will refer you. It's the only reference that I'm going to offer here because I think anything you want to know about Frankenstein you can, can find from their website if you go to it uh, and pursue it. It's, it's got a lot of links and it takes you a lot of different uh, places. It's called the Frankenstein Bicentennial Project on the home page, and here you have the URL. Among other things uh, of interest that I learned from their website uh, is that the editors, um, and actually the three men who are directing this project, David Gustin, Ed Finn, and Jason Scott Robert, were not the originators of the idea of the project. That idea came from a woman colleague of theirs, uh, in literature who had to decline participating in an active way in directing the project because of personal responsibilities that she had in her life at that time. So the idea, a woman's, the execution, 
uh, her male colleagues, and the result is, I think, an extraordinary uh, website with lots of opportunities to interact with their work and lots of opportunities to learn from their work. They have one section they call Franken Book, and they invite people to join in with them in conversations about how they're using the book, uh, how it's working for them or not in uh, their teaching or uh, other projects that they have. And I think it is just uh, a remarkable achievement that they have been able to do. The uh, grant that they got from the National Science Foundation was not the only grant they got. They got a grant, a large grant, from uh, the Arthur Sloan Foundation, which has funded a lot of pro projects in medical education uh, and research. So clearly, it's a work that still is exerting influence over its time and a work that I think provides a backdrop for the kinds of bioethical issues that have been much more specific, I think, in the conversations that you have had today and may continue to have. So I'll stop with that and ask for questions or comments that you might have. As, as Mary Shelley was uh, British, and uh, the work was uh, uh, written in, in, in Switzerland, do you have any ideas on why uh, this family name for, uh, for the doctor, Frankenstein, where, where would that uh, name come as an idea for not an Englishman, nor a Swiss mm -hmm. or French Swiss? Uh, why, why Frankenstein? That's a great question, and I don't know the answer, so all I can do is speculate here. And I'm wondering whether it was because of advances being made in German science at the time, or, you know, although the, the reading that Mary Shelley is doing at the time is not necessarily in, in German science, but it's, it does distance um, the character, I think, from the British and the French. They're, they're staying in French-speaking Switzerland at the time that they're having all of these conversations and writing this. What, what are your thoughts? What brings you to the question? I think it's a great question. Well, I, I, I don't know, but uh, I, I was thinking about the influence from Goethe uh, or uh, even, even maybe Humboldt also, mm -hmm. who worked with uh, galvanism uh, mm -hmm. and, and, and was very well known at the, at the time. And, uh, and of course, the, the German uh, tradition of Faust Mm -hmm. So it would be a, like a way to connect right. this st right. story with, with this German tradition. Right. The name, the Franken part of the name, yeah. you know, I, I don't know where that came from itself. I think you're right in what you're saying. But it's become applied in English now, at least in the States, to so many things. You know, Franken foods, for example, anything that's uh, genetically modified foods, or Franken this, or Franken that. You know, it's just, again, entered popular culture as a phrase that people use as a tagline for expressing concern about some contemporary uh, research development that's changing, they believe, the identity of not only living species, but things they eat and things they do. There's, so. there's a region in the south of Germany that's called Franken. Uh-huh, okay. It's, it's, uh, Fra Franconia in, 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 the, in, in Spanish. Yeah. yeah, thank you for that. I'll have to look into that. Yeah. Appreciate it. Thank you so much for another delighted uh, uh, talk and very illustrative and now I'm just trying to connect my own research with with what you, you just said about creating life mm -hmm. because this uh, this academic event is about creating life right and how has been a uh, high burden for women I'm sorry high burden for women mm -hmm. since the beginning <laughs> and to create good life and for example, I don't know, it's connected to what the doctors say as well, but uh, the, the Germans trying to create good life, 
maybe, I don't know, but it is connected to the mitochondrial diseases. Maybe Mary Shelley, Mary Shelley's descendancy got mitochondrial diseases, so she was never going to be able to give birth to, to sane mm -hmm. children. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So, I, so I am. I want to ask you, what do you think? What is the connection about having a family, having access to other technologies, to to get the children genetically related without being monsters or being dead before they were? I mean, they are me meant to be dead because right. there's no way to alleviate genetic diseases as soon as we do not permit genetic modify like modification. Right. And it's really related to my talk for tomorrow about how we modify embryos in the German line. Mm -hmm. okay. She uh, actually um, gave birth five times um, herself, <laughs> and four of her children died. So she had only one child who lived to adulthood. Um, so I, I'm not sure in, in thinking about her that and her coming to this, that she could have envisioned a time when there would have been artificial um, reproduction, as it were. Um, and what she would have thought of that, I, it's hard to, hard to say, of course. But I think that it raises those questions. You know, if we are going to do these things in our biomedical science and in our uh, medical practice, then I think the issue, uh, for me, large scale from the work, is that we must take responsibility for whatever lives we create. Um, and if they are, it raises very tough bioethical issues, if they are not the lives that we expected to create, if they are different in significant ways, um, and I'm thinking now of things like designer babies and so forth. I mean, can we, as a species, say, okay, we're just gonna discard you know, those others because we didn't get it quite right, and it's really gonna be better for us all. Uh, I think the fears that Frankenstein has at the time he destroys the mate that he is creating for the, his creature, uh, are along those lines, like how can I know what would ever happen if I did this and if they wanted children, right, of, of their own to become a family of the sort that the creature had thought was so idyllic at first until they saw him and were so horrified and behaved so violently toward him. Um, so I, I, th I think it's just um, open to all of those areas of research that are underway, things such as cloning, I mean, we're cloning animals, um, cloning people, I joke, as do many people I know about needing two or three clones, and you know, I'll get all my work done and the time allotted. Um, and it's, it is a joke, but I think if it were possible, of course, you clone something and it doesn't have the same experiences as the original, and so it's never going to be the same. Um, it just is intriguing in what it puts forward, I think, in trying to encourage our um, imaginative efforts to think beyond where we are at the moment in what's being done scientifically. I'm not sure that's an answer, but it's a reflection on what you asked. Yeah. Dr. Hudson, thank you. Um, with such an exemplary um, review of ethical issues and moral issues in what might have seemed back then a simple story. Um, and being that you're um, affiliated with the University of Texas Medical Branch, considering what we're going through in, in ethical, medical ethics and clinical ethics as far as um, the quest for perfect kids, or what's be, what's, what art, artificial reproductive technologies are being used for, the euthanistic um, indications medically for abortion or even in some countries, euthanasia. I wanted to know if you're using this story as part of uh, the bioethics course to pre better prepare pre-med students or even residents or fellows 
And if so, if you've had good results? Um, no, I'm not using it with our medical students at this time, our residents and fellows, for the simple reason that it's very difficult to find a space in which they will read such a long novel. But we did use it this year in the graduate school, UTM, University of Texas Medical Branch at Galveston has a medical school, a graduate school of biomedical sciences, school of nursing, and school of health professions. So in the graduate school of biomedical sciences, the deans started a few years ago the practice of selecting a book um, that they thought would be important for incoming students, first year PhD students in biomedical sciences to read and discuss as they were entering their graduate work. And this year, they asked me uh, about Frankenstein, and I said, absolutely. You know, I think it is the book of the year um, because people are talking about it all over the world. Why not have our students uh, read it and um, talk about it? So they asked me to find an edition that I thought would be best for those students, and I had just seen this one come out and had thumbed through the annotations and so forth. So they bought a copy of this book and sent it to every one of the incoming graduate students, and then we had a session, a morning session with them during orientation, and I was not hopeful that they would have read the book, even though it had been provided to them. And the dean said, oh, we're not going to require them to read it. We're just going to give it to them and see if, ask them to read it. But about two-thirds of, or about 70 or 80 students there, about two-thirds of them had read the novel. The others had seen the movies. So we had interesting discussion there. I was amazed at how carefully they had read and at the serious questions they raised and how seriously they were engaged in the discussion. Finally, the session had to be broken off by the dean because it was going on. And he said, that's never happened before uh, when we've done one of these. We've never run overtime like that. But they were very, uh, they were very much engaged with the sort of research ethics questions that go into, I think, making possible the biomedical technologies that are being used in the clinics. And my hope would be that we can, I'm still in this year, hoping to do some more um, reading and discussion with groups and among those uh, medical students. And I'm trying very hard, I can't uh, recommend enough this London National Theater um, production of the play adaptation of Frankenstein, but it's very difficult to get in this country. It's, I mean, in my country, sorry, perhaps in Colombia too, very difficult to get, and it is English um, language. I don't think there is a Spanish um, text for that play, like subtitles, but it has been made available by the uh, London National Theatre to educational groups in the UK, and it is a relatively short video, I'd say two to three hours. It captures very well, I think, the most important of the ethical issues here. It has visual imagery that's quite remarkable and that sort of hangs in my mind, especially at the end, and this is something that I didn't say, but, but I want to say, of Frankenstein pursuing his creature trying to catch him and kill him uh, at the end of the novel. And because the creature is a lot bigger and stronger than Frankenstein, he can keep moving pretty fast. Uh, so it's a real effort for Frankenstein to follow. But the end of that uh, video of the play has imagery of the two in the, the polar uh, realms frozen by ice, if you will, or with the work frozen by ice, and Frankenstein is still pursuing the monster who is still a little ahead of him, just staying a little ahead of him. And ultimately, Frankenstein dies at the end of the novel. The creature is bereft, turns around, comes back, wants to see his body, and the ship that Robert Walton 
uh, has been sailing with his men, is caught in the ice and provides the, the setting for that. And the imagery that they used in uh, the play is not that of the death of Frankenstein, but that of the pursuit, Frankenstein's pursuit of the creature. And that's what it ends on. And I think that the underlying um, very strong message to me was the extent to which the creator and the creature can never break their ties, no matter how much one might want to, that they're bound to each other, even if there has been abandonment, neglect, um, anger, hatred, uh, and violence. Somehow, what has connected them in that act of creation is so powerful it overrides all of those things. So it's a very striking uh, video. And they did uh, get it at Stanford. They showed it one night in a very old auditorium. Stanford has a, and Stanford has got a lot of money. They have a gorgeous physical structure, new medical school. It's beautiful. Uh, rooms available for any possible use. They showed the video in an old auditorium. We had to walk to another building. It was hard to find at night. Held only about 100 people. Seats were kind of tattered. Wasn't terribly com comfortable. Screen wasn't great. Um, and when I asked them how they were able to get the video, they had a long story, which I won't uh, repeat, but the only thing they were able to get was an old Blu-ray uh, DVD. And the only place on their campus that would still show an old Blu-ray DVD was this auditorium. So that's how they were able to show it once they got it and how we were able to be there in that space. So it's, it's technologically not as up to the moment as, as one would wish for, but I think it is going to last and become, I hope, more readily available and provide that kind of visual imagery that can be so uh, haunting in presenting for us the themes in a different medium, if you will, as that does. And it reminds me of Mary Shelley's letters again, when she writes about the images that, you know, stayed in her mind so powerfully for so long of her infant daughter um, as she, she found her dead in her crib. But also she writes about how this story came to her. Um, they've been telling each other ghost stories at the Villa Diodati, but she talks about an image that she had in a, in a dream that came to her of the moment when this sort of misshapen, oddly, shaped and weirdly colored body was animated and began to come to life and horrified the creator. So I think the images like that uh, can play an important role in, in helping us think and interpret about, interpret these works in, in new ways. So again, I apologize I didn't answer your question, but you gave me a great opportunity to make a prolonged comment. Eh, en, en su charla hizo énfasis eh, en la importancia de los amigos, de los colegas, de los maestros, eh, en las conductas éticas del investigador. Me gustaría que nos ampliara un poco más ese concepto y también como la importancia que hizo ver de la familia a la que Frankenstein, a la que el monstruo eh, ayudaba y le generó en él cosas buenas. Me gustaría que de pronto ampliara un poco más en esos dos conceptos. Okay, let me start. Um, let me start with the first part, the last part. I'm sorry for your question. Um, the family that the monster creature was helping uh, was living um, a very impoverished life, having come up on hard times, um, and were working together just to try to, um, for subsistence purposes really, struggling to, to grow enough food, struggling to do the things that needed to be done. The son had been in love with, was in love with, um, I will say, here for shortcut purposes, an Islamic woman whose father had forbidden her to um, have anything to do with Felix, his name was, and then she is eventually returned to this family. So they had what to the creature looked like this idyllic existence where every evening they came together and they had music and they read together and this 
he wanted to help. He wanted to be like them. He wanted them to welcome him. He wanted to do what he could. He did it um, in secret. He didn't make any move to let them know uh, he was the one who was helping them. Gradually, the family got accustomed to the help. And they, at first, they were, oh, who would do such a thing for us? You know, put firewood right on our doorstep and other kinds of things. And gradually, they came to take it, I think, for granted. Um, and the uh, moment then when they see him and react so violently to him is what really uh, is one of the significant moments in changing his trajectory. Earlier, he had uh, saved a young girl from drowning, the creature, in another place. This was back um, in a different country, as it were. Had seen a young girl drowning, had leaped in, saved her life, but as he was pulling her out of the waters, someone came up and saw what they thought was a monster with the body of this child and began violently um, beating him, shooting him, I believe. So his encounters were of, of that kind, which kept him out of any kind of relationship. What the, the evil, that he, evil, I'll use this term, that he then began to do in killing those who were important to Frankenstein, um, does qualify, I think, as monstrous behavior. But when I was talking with the incoming students in our graduate school, one of them very vehemently said, oh no, he says, nothing that he did was worse than anything humans do on a daily basis. There's no basis for claiming that he is a monster unless you're going to claim that human beings are worse monsters. And I thought it was really interesting how uh, his view was, was widely shared among them. Now, could you repeat the first part of your question? I'm sorry. Es sobre la importancia que usted da en el concepto de los amigos, los colegas y los maestros okay. en el contexto ético del investigador. Yeah, thank you, sorry. Um, I think that the fact that Frankenstein has deliberately cut himself off from his family, although he receives letters from, him, from them regularly and they are afraid that he is ill, that something has happened to him because he doesn't respond. He deliberately does not go back to visit them. Um, they send a friend of his, Henry Clerval, to come and check on him. And Henry gets there sort of after the event has occurred and when Frankenstein is in a kind of delirious state, having reanimated the, or having animated uh, the makeshift body and then having run away from the creature. I think it is the idea that um, creativity, when you're caught up in the creative passion of any endeavor, I think you do become focused almost exclusively on that. And it's difficult to stay in that creative frame of mind when you're focusing on making that happen and also have the kind of perspective and judgment on it that others might have. So to have around you people who are aware of what you're doing, to talk with them, for them to be able to say to you, wait a minute, have you thought about this or what about that? Uh, that might go wrong and to serve as a, as a help in getting um, back into a more balanced sort of view of what you are about and what the potential uh, results of that might be and the effects further on. So I think it is in providing a community, some of the, the dean of our graduate school likes to call it a community of scholars who work together and help each other do the best work they can do, but don't let each other um, breach boundaries that are recognized as being you know, dangerous and potentially ethical uh, minefields if they do so. So I think that's it. And if you stay in, if you're in family, if you're daily um, with people you care about and who care about you, 
it's going to provide a better, I think, mental state, um, better mental health, I would even go so far as to state, because the novel does present, I think, a lot of reason to think that Frankenstein became so disordered, he was delirious, he was doing things that he never would have done had he been back with his family or had he been uh, with his friends um, and commenting on them. An interesting interpretation of his friend Henry Clerval is that his education has not been scientific as Frankenstein's has been, that he's in the humanities and that had he, you know, I'll just, it's not mine, I'll just put it out here, that had he been with Frankenstein while this was going on, his perspectives from his educational background in the humanities would have provided a balance for Frankenstein or could have provided a balance for him that might have mitigated his um, obsession with doing what he did. Um. Es, es, es relativamente, relativamente fácil identificar las consecuencias negativas de la creación del monstruo. Pero usualmente no se destacan algunas digamos, características que pueden ser positivas del creador, del doctor, del joven médico. Y cuando lo discutimos con estudiantes de medicina, ellos resaltan la pasión que ese personaje tiene. Eh, aunque obviamente las consecuencias uh -huh. evidentemente se, se presentan. ¿Usted qué opinión tiene sobre esa pasión que refleja además lo que los médicos hacemos día a día? I think the passion has to be there. Uh, in order, science is very difficult, medicine is very difficult, um, both as professions. They require a lot of training, a lot of dedication, a lot of giving up of other possibilities. And I think the passion has to be there if someone is going to do good work. But the passion has to be um, balanced by sharing the ideas with others who are engaged. So the physicists, I think, working together may, if they're caught up in the same passionate you know, effort, need to talk to people who are not in physics, who might say to them, uh, but wait a minute, uh, think about what the consequ consequences might be. I'm not sure, realistically, that uh, we will ever stop and one would hope not, scientific discovery and advance, but not giving thought to the potential consequences before the fact rather than after the fact, I think is part of what created um, Frankenstein and his dilemma. ¿Qué opina usted de que hagamos tanto énfasis en el uso pedagógico de Frankenstein, en este caso, o de cualquier otra obra de arte, que hagamos mucho énfasis en eso, ¿no será que podemos también perder algo de lo que implica el gusto estético? Frankenstein es una novela que tiene valor per se, y no necesariamente para enseñarle a los médicos cosas sobre la vida y la muerte. Entonces me preguntaba cuál era su opinión sobre eso. I think the um, use of, and I'm going to say that advisedly, use of literature in medical settings is always tilting toward that side. It's very difficult um, to maintain the focus on the literary work and the qualities of the work that make it um, aesthetically skillful and that make it, many would say, last over centuries, as Frankenstein has. But I think the two are not totally separate. I think part of what creates a work that does last and that captures, that engages readers and captures their imagination um, requires a work that is um, thoughtful, is original, and is well written, well said, well filmed. Uh, because of the power of the aesthetic aspects of it. It's tough to keep those in the proper balance in uh, reading and talking about them in certain settings because the desire of many to just, you know, just let's, let's get a take home, you know, moral here and we'll be done uh, may override the day. 
but I think if it weren't for the aesthetic qualities of many of these works, they wouldn't last. It's the difference between what I call formula fiction, uh, which is fiction written with a kind of formula, you kind of know how it's going to go. So a lot of the Western uh, in American literature, or a lot of science fiction is written according to a certain uh, formula. The romantic novel, uh, romantic novelists are very popular in the United States. They sell thousands and thousands of books, but they do so because they satisfy what the reader wants to know. And I think that is what is neither helpful in a pragmatic way, nor is it um, aesthetically likely to last. I think, and I haven't said much about this, but I think the frame that Mary Shelley provides for the main story of Robert Walton, who is exploring the Arctic and who is passionate about that exploration, and who with his ship is caught in the ice and their chances of making, of, of living, surviving, and making it back to England are very, very small. And he shares certain affinities with Frankenstein and the devotion toward the quest, if you will, of new knowledge, new experience, new exploration. And yet he turns around. His men say, we want to go home and he makes the decision to give up his passionate desires to turn that ship around. And I think the putting of that frame, which is often left off, but the putting of that frame into the novel is what gives it not only an aesthetic um, frame, if you will, setting, but also an ethical and moral dimension that are really important. And I mentioned the sublime. Uh, in the Alps, in the snow, and the ice, the sense that moving beyond, uh, let's say, the, the more gentle versions and times of Lake Geneva into these environments that are so harsh and yet so, um, I don't know, appealing in wanting to venture into them places human beings in a kind of setting where Things are not as they usually are, and questions about the nature and the other aspects of the world that are greater than we are come, come to the fore. And I think part of that is caught up in the aesthetic, but it's not so easy to talk about, I think, when using the work in certain, certain settings where the more immediate kind of issues are often foregrounded. Dr. Jones, thanks a lot for having shared with us all of your knowledge, your perspective, your point of view on this great novel, which is part of our culture, our modern world. And I think that in the environment there is eagerness now of uh, how to read the novel. Uh, thank you again. Thank you. Thank you.